Welcome to the Entrepreneur Next Door. This is Zev Ash, and it's my pleasure to welcome Shlomo Genshin to the podcast. Shlomo, please introduce yourself. Hi, Zev. Thank you so much. It's incredible to be here. Uh, I'm Shlomo. I'm a creative copywriter and content creator on LinkedIn. I have a blog called thecreativemarketer.net, where I break down creative techniques and teach people how to brainstorm. Well, first of all, I teach myself, and then I just show others how I do it. And yeah, besides, I'm working as a copywriter, uh, usually for big agencies, but from tomorrow, actually, I'll be, start, I'll be starting a new role with a venture capital firm called Ground App. And yeah, just moving into the tech sphere a little bit uh, to try and see how it is there and you know how we can make B2B a bit more creative and fun. And yeah, I think that's it. Besides, yeah, I guess personally, I'm a, I'm a surfer. You can see the <laughs> board behind. And yeah, besides that, I live with my girlfriend, Cal, and uh, right now in Israel. Before that, I lived in Berlin. And yeah, I think that's it for now. <laughs> so, so since we're both from, from Israel, where, where are you surfing? In Haifa. <laughs> Yeah. In Haifa, wow. Yeah. All right. So, uh, so I, I actually grew up in Tel Aviv, um, literally a block from from the ocean. Yeah. Uh, and if you know, te, you know Tel Aviv, the original hotel on the beach was the Den Hotel. It's still yeah. there. So sure. if you if you take the Den Hotel and you go one block up, uh, mm -hmm. that's, that was you know my my apartment. My that's where I grew up. Wow. And literally, we we get up especially when school was over. So some end of May through end of August, I would get up. First thing I would do is brush my teeth, go to the window. And if I saw waves, I would just, <laughs> just run down. And I spent yeah. my entire, I spent my entire life on that beach, literally from age six, seven, till I went into the army. And wow. uh, the, the ocean's always been my love because I was right there. Yeah. But my my father freaked out that I actually ran away mm -hmm. at, at at six seven ran away and just the the ocean always attracted me uh, to this day I just I'm a completely different person when I'm next to a body of water but uh, he freaked out that I was young and didn't know how to swim <laughs> so, um, so he went and we had a grocery store not far and we lived right above the grocery store so the yeah. lifeguards used to come in every morning and get sandwiches for lunch. So he said to one of the, the head life guy one day, said, listen, he always runs away and he winds up at the beach <laughs> and I have to run a store. And, and so could you just teach him how to swim? <laughs> just do that for me, right? And they did. They taught me how to swim by showing me how to do it on the beach. Then he put me on the hasake, which is the, the they, don't, they don't have hasakes anywhere except in Israel. Yeah, and he but literally put me on a hasake between his legs, went out past the waves, mm -hmm. uh, and threw me in the water. Yeah, and just stuck, <laughs> stuck around, watch me go back, and that's eventually a couple weeks later I was fine. <laughs> but so anyway, enough about me. Uh, so Shlomo, you know how I do this, and by the way, you're my my second copywriter, a uh, guest for a reason. Mm -hmm. uh, Ed Eden Bidani, who is uh absolutely the most incredible person and talented she is. She talented is. <laughs> copy artist i've i've ever come across and i've been around the block a few times um but for me the reason why i love to bring copywriters to my podcast which is about entrepreneurship uh, obviously we talk about marketing but it's really about the stories of entrepreneurship success failure mm -hmm. um Copywriting is, I don't want to call it the lost art. I think it's gaining more respect yeah. as we move forward. Um, but copywriting is, is like the missing piece of anyone who does marketing and doesn't yeah. do it really well. So that's why I want, to, I want to dig into that with you when we get to there. But first, as I always do, um, we're on video so I can see you. Uh, but you're a young guy. How, what, what, when you were 15, 16, what were you thinking about if I ran into you and said, Moishe, Shlomo, what do you want to be when you grow up? <laughs> yeah, I think, I think I knew that I want to do something creative. Um, I, I used to be in 
you know, I used to take theater classes in, in high school. And I think that's that's a direction I was, yeah, at least I thought I was heading to. Uh, um, but yeah, I guess I guess that's what I would say that I, I would either be maybe like a military officer or something, because I guess that's what every teenager in Israel thinks, <laughs> or, or I would be an actor. Um, yeah, I, I never thought of writing back then, but, but yeah, but eventually that's, that's became my main thing, which, which is kind of connected to acting in a way. <laughs> well, it's, it's, yeah, it's, uh, look, copywriting is, is an art form and it is absolutely is, is about being creative for sure. Yeah. Um, who am I to tell you? You're the copywriter. Um, <laughs> but so, 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 did you grow up in Israel? You spent all years yeah, in yeah. Israel. Yeah, I grew oh. up in in Jerusalem. Uh, I think I think the picture behind you, right? Or maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, I think I think it's Jerusalem, the the old city. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I grew up in Jerusalem, and yeah, when I was 22, about five years ago, I moved to Berlin. Um, first, I got interested in copywriting um, just right after my military service. I started, yeah, I started looking for things I could do. And I remember I came across one of those CAM courses online where you can get rich in two days. And yeah, I took the course. Obviously, I didn't get rich, um, but I discovered copywriting and I discovered that that was an option and, you know, you could write things and get you know, people to buy things. <laughs> that's, that's, so, that was that. Yeah. But so, but you took acting classes. Did you do any writing in high school before the military service or? Yeah. Did you just... yeah. I, I used to, I used to do like, yeah, we used to do a lot of writing, you know, for short skits and for, you know, funny videos we made or, 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 you know, even when we we're editing uh, plays or, or short scenarios we've written uh, so, you know, stuff like that. Uh, but actually, the military was one of the most creative times. Um, and it's kind of surprising. But, um, you know, there I had I had a lot of, you know, I had many chances to write also songs and poetry. And, and actually think that you wouldn't expect uh, someone would do in the military. Uh, but that ended up being one of the most creative phases of my life that showed me that I actually had that passion. <laughs> but wait, so for, for people that don't know israel as well and they hear <clears throat> oh you went to the army the first thing they think about is you know israeli army's got the reputation of you know a small but really the david versus goliath you know you're we're militant yeah. we're we're like navy seals everywhere and here's here's a guy who went to the army and was writing songs and poetry so <laughs> What were you doing? Were you in Nahal or were you somewhere else? <laughs> uh, no, I was in in the K nine unit actually. Uh, I was I was a dog handler, uh, a combat oh. dog handler. Yeah, but but still, uh, you know, like I think I think every like any army eventually is made of kids. <laughs> so mm -hmm. you know, and, and these kids who you know in any other country they would have been in college. Um, then then in the military they do pretty much the same things, I guess on a different like you know on a smaller scale but still you know they want to have fun they want to um, they want to make jokes and uh, yeah and i think that was that was just a big part of it and yeah i think it would be the same in, in any country but yes especially in israel where it's mandatory and eventually everyone en ends up going so so i think that that makes you know a really good bunch of people like yeah just the situation where a really good bunch of people uh, hang out together and and sometimes even create fun things <laughs> yeah yeah it's it's actually the um the, the i think the camaraderie of and i think one of my podcast interviews was probably um I'm trying to remember who it was we talked about the military service and one of the 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 profound aspects of of serving other than the fact it's mandatory yeah but i, I mean i couldn't wait to join the army when I was a kid. It wasn't like, oh my God, I have to go serve. No, we, you wanna go and protect your country. And, and it was part of our upbringing. But one of the incredible aspects of being in the military was literally being in a tent with people from all walks of life. Yeah. Right? So when you join the army and you, and you put that ugly brown uniform on, uh, we're all equal. Right. Doesn't mm -hmm. matter if your father's a doctor or in my case, my dad was a grocery store guy or yeah. or your father is a is a minister in, in the Knesset. That means nothing. We're all in the tent in that ugly uniform 
mm-hmm. and we're in there. And, and so it's a really, really good human behavior lesson of how you mesh personalities and cultures and different backgrounds. Um, and it does something to you if you're open to it, to open yeah. your eyes to, wow, there's a, there's a whole world around me. Very often it's next door, right? Yeah. But you tend to ignore it. So you, you go to Berlin. Why did you pick Berlin to go to school? Other than I think it's free, right? Yeah. And, and just before we, we continue with that, with that journey, yeah. I, I very much agree with, you know, with this experience of meeting people from all walks of life. And I think this is like, that's also very relevant to, to copywriting and marketing later. Um, because I think, you know, I saw that, um, that funny meme um, the other day where there's a bunch of guys in suits sitting around a table and one of them is asking, so who knows how, I don't know, like, who, like anyone has any idea how per person thinks or, you know, like what, what per people think like, or <laughs> I don't know what they look like, any, anything of that. So, and I, and I think this is like, you know, this is like this kind of situation where, where you get to meet different people, people that are a little bit, uh, as you said, like from different walks of life. And it really, and it also also helps you get kind of a different insight on, on marketing and on life and on things that later you need to, you know, you need to use when you're, you know, when you're selling things, um, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. And, and look, I'm a marketing guy, uh, always been one. And uh, my attraction to marketing was actually through my obsession with the human brain. So I was a psychology yeah. major. Uh, in college and really didn't have the money to be able to go through a PhD in psychology. So I, I did a, a slight left turn and got an MBA in marketing. But for me to this day, yeah, marketing is about human behavior. I mean, mm-hmm. we, we tend to get sucked in by the sexiness of different things in marketing, but it, it all comes down at the end to a human being making a decision. Yeah, And if you can understand how they... We'll, we haven't figured it out yet how everybody thinks but if you can understand the drivers and the influences of human behavior uh and then you can translate that into different forms of marketing copywriting being the key uh then you'll do okay yeah uh, so you go to berlin and you study what and i studied copywriting so there is a portfolio school called miami ad school and it's a funny name, but they have branches all over the world. So they started in Miami and, you know, now we have Miami at school, Berlin, Miami at school, Madrid, <laughs> and mm-hmm. pretty much ever in New York too, by the way. And yeah. yeah, and I started studying there. Um, it was, it was a great experience again, just like you, I also like, you know, international uh, business and meeting with, with people from all over the world. So, so it was a great, you know, it was a great opportunity to do that. And yeah, I met some, some incredible people and teachers and, you know, just, I think it's not even the knowledge because you can find that knowledge in any book. Eventually all the literature is, is written already, but just this experience of spending two and a half years uh, with people, with like-minded people, with other creatives, just coming up with ads all day long, um, really got this, you know, passion and got this, you know, skill going uh, in my life. Um, and yeah, you know, and, and after that, I could kind of look back and see that and see that, okay, like, you know, I, I used to kind of analyze the things that we did after, after brainstorming sessions and after uh, we delivered the ads, I used to always go back and look at, at, at what we did, like how the process looked like, because that was the most interesting part to me, um, to see those techniques behind, you know, behind the things we did. Because eventually, because eventually, I think that creatives you can split them into two kind, two types. The types, the, the magicians, the the kind of creatives that, uh, you know, they just brainstorm every time and they kind of wait for the muse. Maybe yeah, maybe even the rock stars I would call them. <laughs> and yeah, and every brainstorming session is very random for them. Uh, and and the other type, um, which I consider myself. Um, one of those people, um, the more the more structured one, you know, the, the ones that that kind of like to work nine to five, and think that creativity is a more uh, structured thing that you need that you can practice that you can cultivate, and yeah, that's I think that's the biggest lesson I, I've learned there, like during in those years. So, when was the first time? So you go through school for two and a half years, you do lots of 
copywriting, lots of ads. Um, when was the first time you actually got paid to do to for a copywriting job? Well, that was that was much before I, I started studying because um, as I told you, like even before, like right after that sketchy course <laughs> that I took, um, I started, I discovered copywriting and, you know, I didn't know much, but I read a little bit on the internet and I, I decided that I'm a copywriter. So I started going around my hometown, Jerusalem, and just offer different bi small businesses to, to write content for them. Like that's what I knew back then. And uh, yeah, and that's what I did. I got my first client. It was uh, like an, a chain of escape rooms. And yeah, I started working for, for the guy, really, you know, fixing, fixing up his, his social media, his website. And that was the first paid project I did. Um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't even want to say how much I charged for that. Uh, that would be embarrassing. <laughs> but yeah, but it was my first paid gig and it was great. You know, I, I enjoyed that a lot. I did that in the evenings after my day job. And yeah, that was, that was really the first time I got paid for writing. <laughs> so, so I have a question. It's, it's, it might be a silly question. It's really yeah. not, but, but it goes to <laughs> really goes deep into this whole copywriting marketing thing that I want to talk about with you. Mm -hmm. Um, the person that hired you for the escape escape room chain company where they have multiple locations do you think they hired you because you charged them so little or because they had some sort of an awareness that what they had on their website or direct mail whatever it is they were promoting the escape rooms with was actually crap <laughs> no, I think I think it was totally totally the second, you know, like I'm sure it wasn't the price. I mean, there was like, you know, I charged little just because I was still learning and you know, I didn't want to charge too much anyway. And and I think that's that's a problem. I still have until this day. I feel like all creatives have, I guess all people have all freelancers have it. It's always hard to, you know, to charge what you're worth. Um, but you know, today I got better, of course, but still it's, 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 you know, the, then I was just learning. So, so I didn't even feel mm -hmm. comfortable to charge. I just knew I shouldn't do it for free. Um, so I did almost for free, <laughs> but yeah, I think it was definitely this, this awareness and, you know, this, I guess this passion that I had, um, just to show him a few things and I, and I still pitch the same way, by the way, I think like, you know, when you can, rather than just offering your services and speaking about yourself and saying how awesome you are, if you can, you know, look, take, you know, it, it takes 20 or 30 minutes. If you can just go through the communication or the marketing of the, of the person and see what, or, or the company and see what they have there and find a few mistakes and show them how you could fix that. That's usually enough to close the deal. And I feel like that's, right, so, yeah. So, so, so your pitch was, here's your, I, I'm, I'm joking, right? Here's your crappy website <laughs> and yeah. here's what it could look like if you actually let me fix it. And he said, hmm, okay, that's... <laughs> I, so the thing is, many founders and many business owners to this day, even though we, we think we're so sophisticated, just miss that point. They think that what's on there, especially because in more times than not, the founder, the owner, the president, actually wrote the copy because they think yeah their business and they know it better than anybody else and then what's wrong with it i mean i wrote it don't <laughs> you think it's good it's good isn't it it's, yeah it's really good this i wrote it it's good <laughs> i know my business you don't think it's good you know it's like yeah. it's like almost like it's like an israeli israeli dialogue what do you yeah, mean it... Shlomo, you <laughs> i wrote either it either it's good or you're fired <laughs> that's it yeah, there you go <laughs> All right, yeah. so so you start that before you go to Berlin. Then Berlin, you get through some intense, uh, actual, hands-on kind of work. When was because in your LinkedIn you say that you work with Burger King, Michelin, Coca-Cola, Budweiser. Tell me about one of those. When did you have an opportunity to actually work on a on an international brand? Yeah, so one of the one of the coolest opportunities I got was with Burger King. Um, so when, when I was almost at the end of my studies, I did an internship at Ogilvy in Berlin, and I met this really awesome creative director there, there uh, called Tomas, and we really hit it off from the from the beginning, and you know we kind of worked together together with my partner Alexa and a few other 
uh, people on our team, a few other interns. And yeah, through the whole internship, we worked together. And almost, you know, I think it was like the last few days of the internship, um, Thomas told me, yeah, look, um, if you can come up with an idea for Burger King, I will show it to the, you know, to the one of the creative directors or I don't know, people at the top. And yeah, it was basically, you know, we had like three days to do that. And we were almost, uh, it was almost our vacation. And eventually we, we ended up doing it on our vacation and, you know, just like without getting paid or anything. Um, but, you know, we're, Alexa and I were really passionate and, you know, we just started working on that day and night. Um, and eventually we created this campaign. Uh, it won a lot of awards, including BNAD and a few others. Um, yeah, so the campaign was basically about when everything opened up again in Berlin after the lockdown. It was still COVID back then. Um, so we created those posters, those billboards, where we showed how people used to eat during the lockdown because, you know, the only option was to take food out. And people didn't really, <laughs> people couldn't really, you know, they didn't really have anywhere to eat, especially in Europe where it was freezing cold. Uh, so, you know, my friends and I, we used to always just take the food and improvise tables just, just somewhere on the street. Um, so, yeah, so we would just, you know, use a staircase as a table or just, yeah, or just some, I don't know, uh, buy crack or, yeah, it, it, could, it could be anything, basically. Uh, so we took uh, like a few pictures of, of people just doing just that. And that was the campaign, uh, basically. And, you know, Tomas, he was, he was amazing. He really pushed us. Uh, forward to work on that the creative director and yeah and eventually it was a very successful campaign and also a great experience because you know as you as you said it was it was very human and it was based on our own experience of of, of the things we went through during covid and i think that's why other people could also connect to, to it and like it so in in typical stories like this you work for Ogilvy, which is a, a major ad creator agency, uh, well known around the world. You you execute an amazing campaign for an, an, a huge brand. What typically the story usually ends is, and I got a really big job offer to be <laughs> doing this at Ogilvy. Yeah, but <laughs> I, I didn't I didn't see on your LinkedIn profile that you work for Ogilvy, so that that didn't happen. Uh, I mean, the, the offer happened, but <laughs> but I never accepted it because I decided that that, you know, just working at an agency is not for me. And when I graduated, I decided that I want to start freelancing. And during that time, I also discovered LinkedIn and I saw and in general writing online. Before that, I wasn't really aware of that. I just knew, you know, the advertising industry. And I thought that, you know, if you want to be a creative, there is only one way to do that. And that's kind of working at an agency. Uh, but then when I discovered the LinkedIn community too, and I discovered people like Eddie Schleiner and Dave Herland and Ed and Bidani too, and I saw what, what they're doing, I thought like, okay, so maybe there is also, you know, there are also other aspects of copywriting that are also interesting and I, and I could explore. And maybe starting a job at Ogilvy or any other agency right now would be a bad idea. And instead of that, I could just fly to Mexico or Costa Rica surf work from there write linkedin content and that could be a lot of fun and it could be a great adventure <laughs> and that's what i did actually and and since then you so, know <laughs> i have like a side question maybe i'm i'm prying but i always ask the question of my guests um are your parents entrepreneurs or they are or they work like no, that not not at all, not at all. Actually, my they're very conservative. Like they're very supportive, but they're also very conser conservative about it. Um, they're both work, you know, very hard all their lives. Um, they're they actually immigrated from the Soviet Union, um, the beginning of the nineties. Mm -hmm. Um, so you know, so in in their culture, in the, the conditions they grew up in, uh, entrepreneurship wasn't an option at all. It wasn't you know something that anyone would do. And, uh, you know, and even when they came to Israel, all, all, they had two kids and all they tried to do is, you know, basically feed them and, and get along. Uh, so, no, it's, it, it's never been part of, of my family or of my education. Um, and, I, and I'm grateful, you know, that they could give me the, oppor you know, the opportunity mm -hmm. to, 
to do that, you know, that I always had the, the safety and the conditions and I never had to worry. I knew that even if my new venture or, or new stupid idea would fail, I could, I can always go back and crash on my parents' couch. <laughs> Um, I, I mean, I, I, I asked the question because I kind of sense what, what, what I thought the answer would be, which is what you told me. So then I know that if, if I was going to my dad who had, who had a grocery store and worked really hard all his life from four in the morning to eight at night, yeah. and I said to him, I just got an offer from one of the, the most well-known ad agencies in the world to work for them. But, you know, and instead... Now nah, I'm just gonna go hop around, enjoy life, do what I want to do as a freelancer. Uh, my my dad would have told me, "Why would you do that?" Right? Because because <laughs> we, we're we're scripted to this is like the next phase in your career. If you can work for Ogilvy for three to four or five years, I always call that the golden resume, right? Then you can yeah. go spin this off and go chase all kinds of different things. But you had the courage to say no um was it because you were you wanted you didn't want to be confined to a, a cubicle writing ads for different clients uh or is it because you just didn't want to compromise what you felt was kind of a lifestyle that you wanted to pursue i think i think it's both like yeah the lifestyle has a very you know has, has a lot of meaning here because eventually uh, at some point, I understood that living in Europe is, is not an option for me. Uh, it, it's just too cold, you know. I, I love I love the <laughs> infrastructure, I love the people, I love the culture, <laughs> but it's just hard for me to, you know. Here here in Israel, it's always sunny, and everywhere <laughs> I traveled after, it, it was always sunny, <laughs> like all year round. So <laughs> so that's something that's you know that's important to me. Uh, but but you know, but prof- like, speaking professionally professionally. Um, I think that like the thing that was hard was hardest for me to to accept was that I won't be able to create things for myself anymore because if you're working full time, you're not able to you know you're just in that loop where you always have work to do, you're always working for clients, you're not always choosing them. But the mo- the main problem is that you never have time to create your own weird stuff. And and I decided that I always want to work. And, and that's the way I'm working now. No, no matter what I'm doing, I'm always, I'm, I'm never working with clients um, more than three days per week. I'm always keeping two days uh, for my own projects and my own stuff and creative explorations. And, you know, even sometimes, I mean, financially, it's, it's always like, it's not the smartest decision at the moment. Uh, but I think the, you know, the ROI on that is good because, you know, I have time to, to put out a lot of content eventually and, and people are liking that. And, Mm-hmm. And that helps me grow my business. But even, you know, just for me personally, it makes things, you know, it makes this job of being creative much better because, because I actually get to be creative just for myself two days per week or three days per week. And, and that would makes me happy. And that's something I would never, you know, give up for, for any job. Mm-hmm. And, and freelancing is a form of entrepreneurship. I mean, you're, you're in business for yourself, but it's, it's, it's sort of, it, it is, a, I mean, any entrepreneurship has roller coaster aspects to it, but mm-hmm. freelance is especially that life is, is you don't really know what's going to happen tomorrow, right? Yeah. I mean, if you're going to, if you're going to, and I actually worked with two very, very talented Ukrainian guys who were in a Google PPC world mm-hmm. and they were mostly on Upwork. Uh, so if you're an Upwork Fiverr freelancer, with yeah. the thousands and thousands of competitors that are out there. Um, that's a tough, freelancing in general is a tough, a tough track to follow, right? Yeah. Because you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. You, you sort of wait for the phone to ring. Yeah. But in your case, because you're a creative guy, you're doing enough things and I've, I've been fine. That's how I came across you in, in my explorations. Uh, your stuff on LinkedIn is brilliant. So, you so what much. you're doing is you're you're not sitting around waiting for the phone to ring. You are openly sharing what you know, uh, and people connect with that. And so, obviously, the byproduct is this guy's really talented. Maybe I can hire him. But I don't think. Uh, I mean, I can tell from from reading copy and looking at content if someone is genuine, or 
they're smart, they're polished enough to write the content, but what they're really doing is selling, right? To me, there's a, there's a, there's a marked distinction between the art of marketing and then taking that and, and actually doing sales, but dressing it as marketing. Uh, yeah. To me, it's pretty obvious, maybe because I've been doing it for so long, my intuition is rarely wrong. Your stuff is genuinely, uh, it's, it's good stuff. It's like listening to uh, somebody who plays the, the violin, just sit, sit in a subway and just riff on, on a piece. You're playing it. You, you're creating content <laughs> relative to copywriting, but it's interesting. And I want to talk about a few things you posted that I thought were brilliant. Thank um, you, Zach. <laughs> so, so how is, look, you, you kind of gave it up. You said I was 22. Then I went to Germany. I took my thing. And now it's five years later. So you're a young guy. You were 27. Soon, yeah. <laughs> Turning soon. <laughs> soon. You're not even 27. <laughs> um, you've got a, an incredibly impressive followers uh, on LinkedIn, which is really the platform that most of us really live on. I mean. We don't go to the other universe of the Facebook crap and all the other nonsense. <laughs> no, um, no. So, uh, you know, at almost 27, you're establishing yourself as, as somebody that people are paying attention to. Um, and, and I think you, you said it's not about a secret. Your strategy is I love doing what I do. And so I'm going to share what I learn, what I find, what I know how to do openly. And is that the major driver for, for revenue for you is people find you through LinkedIn, through some of the courses or the products that you sell, right? Or you offer? Yeah, yeah, um, absolutely. Like, as you said, mo most 99% of my leads are inbound and um, just people who find me through LinkedIn organically and reach out and we, we work together. Um, I think that yeah, you said that the life of you know freelancer is a roller coaster. But actually, to me, I always enjoy both you know both sides of it. If I'm if I'm up, if, you know, I don't know if, if that's the right metaphor. But you know, if I have clients at that moment or projects that I want to work on, that I'm enjoying that. But if I don't have anything that I'm interested in, and you know, I just have this free month, then I always have something to do, and you know, that's more time for. For my own for my own stuff, for example, last month I didn't find anything that I was happy to work on, uh, or anything that was interesting to me. Then I just uh, spent that month writing a guide for for freelancers, a portfolio guide, and you know that was that was fantastic. Just just doing that, just focusing on my own products and stuff for for a whole month. And so, do when you pick clients to work with, so the 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 creative copywriting piece of it. Um, are you picky or would you, or if somebody says to you, hey, I, I need you to, I need you to redo my website. I need you to redo the copy for my website. Uh, do you look at it? Does it, do you need to have a little spark of curiosity and excitement or it doesn't matter? You can take, <laughs> uh, you can take, uh, uh, you know, th there's a company in the US called Roto Rooter, which is, they, they, if you have cesspools, which we don't have in Israel, but that's when, you know, when you have a home, you have to actually build in your yard a big tank that collects all the waste from the toilet, yeah. right? And sometimes it gets flooded, or sometimes your sink gets flooded. So if I was Roto Rooter and I said to you, Shlomo, our, our crappy site, <laughs> all puns intended, needs to be, would you take it or are you picky? <laughs> I mean, if it would be crappy and, and fascinating, then sure, I would, I would take it. But but yeah, but I'm I'm very picky, honestly. I always try to follow the hell yeah or no rule. And yeah, and if it's not not hell yeah, then then I never take it. I mean, I say no to 99% of the projects because because I know that at this point my my time you know is worth more than I could earn for for that specific project. And you know, I don't I don't have kids and I don't have any responsibilities or commitments. So I don't really need to, you know, I don't really need to earn all the time. So I always prefer to spend my time on something exciting. And if someone is willing to pay for that, um and and they're willing to pay enough for that, then I'm happy to do that. And if they're not, then I always have enough of my own creative stuff to do. And yeah, and that and that's been working pretty well for me because I think otherwise I would I would have just burned burned out like pretty quickly. 
And yeah, so, so that, that's why I'm very picky. And I also think that coming back to the, you know, to this LinkedIn creation thing, um, I wouldn't say that it's just, just like only doing the stuff that I like, but it's even more um, just, just, you know, just about teaching myself, like learning, like this, this very active learning. Uh, because I remember when I just got started, I spoke to my friend and, you know, I had this very severe case of, of imposter syndrome. And I asked him, like, what, what should I do? Because, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert. I mean, I've done a few things, uh, but I can't really, you know, speak, speak like those big experts who have 20 years of experience. So, so what should I do? And he told me a very smart thing. He told me, you know, you know, those people, um, you know, those people on YouTube who have, you know, who are just building a boat or building a van. They're just, they're just building something, you know, they're not showing their fancy yacht or, or their fancy life. They're just showing you how step after step they're, they're building their, their stupid boat. <laughs> and, it's, and he told me yet. Yeah, so just be the guy who builds the boat. Like everyone likes, likes that guy, you know, like no one wants to see the, someone who just brags all day or, or, you know, someone who already made it. People want to see the process. And that was a very helpful tip. And from, from that point, I always, like every piece of content I share, I always ask myself, like, am I building a boat here? Is that, you know, is that kind of, does that align with that principle? And every time, you know, every time it does, people like it. And when, when I kind of, you know, when I kind of try to do different things and I'm, I don't know, bragging or, or just doing something that is a little bit different from, from that ideology i would say then i always see that my audience doesn't like that so i always go back to you know to the right path <laughs> so i think it's it's amazing that at almost 27 and so when are you going to be 27 when is your birthday <laughs> yeah it's in march yeah <laughs> oh okay so it's a few months away yeah. Uh, at, the ten, <laughs> at the tender age of almost 27, <laughs> you di you're discovering something that took me a while, even as a mature, experienced businessman, when I went off on my own 11 years ago, it took me the better part of around 18 months mm -hmm. uh, from starting to work for free. Because, because by the way, the, one of the most, the, the most frightening questions when you go off on your own, on your day one of your new freelance career or or business coaching career that i had mm -hmm. the first the question that is the most frightening is do you have any references can i speak to some of your clients but i don't have any yeah right? um so what do you do i mean people normally don't want to take a chance on somebody that just started it's just not human nature yeah so i had to i had to coach for free for six months to get uh, enough of clients that I can use the references. The way I yeah. got around them, even if you coach for free, but how do I know? How do I know? Do you know how to do this if this is your first time? Well, go yeah. look on my LinkedIn. There's 37 different recommendations from people that work for me, clients, whatever. It's not about what I do or who. It's about more about who I am that you should yeah. care about on the coaching side. So, what has taken me a while. And people always ask me, what's the number one lesson you learn in, in being an entrepreneur for 11 mm -hmm. years? Without hesitation, knowing how to pick the right client yeah. is the skill set that takes a while and you have to get to it because great clients will get you excited every morning to go to work, make you feel fulfilled, right? get that creative energy in you and you feel that you're doing something for a purpose. The bad clients will suck the living daylights out of you they and <laughs> bother you 17 times a day over nonsense. And oh, by the way, they also don't pay well. So, so you <laughs> discover it. So you're, you're, you acquired an amazing skill, courageous skill that to say no, right? Yeah, which, which is which is which is which is admirable and, and amazing. So uh, we're marketing guys, and anybody that I've, that I work with that has a product or a service, I always start with the same question with them, and it's not a trick question. It's a, it's a it's a really deep question. Shlomo, what problem are you solving? Yeah. as a copyright as a copywriter. As a copywriter or as a content creator, because I think uh, these are uh, okay. So yeah. 
but but copywriting i think is what you get paid to do That's and the true. content the content is what you do in order to get visibility exposure engagements which eventually lead to the, to the copywriting so That's as true. a copywriter what problem are you solving the pro the main problem I'm solving is that I'm helping businesses preach what they practice, um, and that's that's not my that's not my quote. I've heard it from someone else, but I think that's the best way to sum to sum up my job and any any marketing job, um, because eventually I feel like you know there's this stigma about marketing where we just lie all the time and we're trying to cover up for for things that are not not true. But in most cases that you know that I encountered, it's usually the opposite. Usually the clients are doing incredible things and they just have no idea how to, how to speak about it. And, and I think that's, that's the main, main part of it, you know, just being able to, to see what they're already doing and, and bringing that and bringing that and telling that story. Um, and I think that's, you know, that, that's just the main part of it. Like it's, it's already there. It's just about recognizing it, recognizing that, that magic and finding a cool way to, to tell that. Yeah. And, and again, interesting that that was your answer because it goes back to really good copywriting is genuine. It's not mm -hmm. fluff and it's not trying to make something out of something that doesn't work. It's, and that's why, I mean, Look, when I work with clients, uh, I don't prejudge whether the product or service is good or not. That's not for me, right? What I tell them is, can, can we bring you to a point where you get a fair chance at competing with other people that do what you do, right? Yeah. If you're, right? And, and that's really kind of what we do is, is, is elevate them from a me too into something that could be a me too but has some sort of a differentiating quality yeah. and uh look i'm like i'm not a huge fan of simon senek i mean i was initially but then when he became an industry of the why <laughs> thing everybody kind of spits it out all the time but yeah. but the the brilliant part of his ted talk was was correct people yeah. do business not because of what you sell but why you do what you do um yeah. and that's but that's always a challenge with with marketing is to to bring this out into the open from mm -hmm. from the clients right because all yeah. they want to do is sell stuff right that's true and so um you know one of your uh, one of your brilliant posts that i saw was pretty interesting you comp you took some of the best slogans or taglines as sometimes we refer to them and you you tested them on grammarly which I'm a, a big user of Grammarly because it just helps me, stops me when I spit something out and says, wait, that doesn't make sense. But so you took it and it was a really, it was really brilliant. Um, but let's talk about that, right? Um, you, you said that you, you made an important distinction. The Grammarly focuses on correct writing, but misses an important critical aspect. Yeah. What is yeah. it? The human touch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's the big, you know, that's the big difference. And I feel like there, there was like maybe a year and a half ago when I, when I made that post, but since then a lot of things changed in that, you know, I, I feel like Grammarly was one of the first AI softwares that copywriters or creatives used to use. Uh, but now, you know, starting from this month, we already have chat GPT, uh, which is the next generation of, of Grammarly, I would say it's it's a whole it's a whole different uh, thing, and but but it still have the same you know but but it still have the same principle. Though. Like the, the thing that I said about that is is still correct here, uh, mm -hmm. because AI will always do the correct thing, the most you know the most precise and the most right, um, you know it will always write the most <clears throat> correct piece of copy, but it won't be the most human piece of copy where we just you know right as we speak where we just say random things that are not always you know they don't always belong to that sentence or they don't always make sense but that what makes good copy special and you know those even those little words that they shouldn't be there but they're there and that that what makes them great <laughs> so I, I was kind of thinking um about 2022 and what potentially has been some some 
quote unquote game changers in the world of marketing yeah. uh, on business in general. And, and I mean, for me, I, I'm clearly can point to the emergence of AI into more of the mainstream, uh, even though AI is still developing. Um, but particularly when it comes to writing and particularly when it comes to copywriting, right? Yeah. Uh, and I've tested a couple of the platforms. And um, so I guess the question is, if you were 45-year-old guy who's been doing copywriting for the last 20, 30 years, and I asked you the question, I think I know what you would tell me, but you're almost 27. <laughs> so there's... So there's, there's a whole bunch of new AI, copywriting AI platforms that are out there. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you go into the dashboard, and, I've and I said I've tested two or three of them, uh, and you go into the dashboard, and it will tell you, this is how you can do great email subject line. This is how you do email body. This is you create a checklist. This is how you do... Uh, LinkedIn, you know, profile summary. This is how you write an email body. Uh, it's all there. Okay. Yeah. Um, how do you feel about that? So, first of all, I'm I'm very excited about that. Um, I feel like that's that's the that, that is going to be my main focus in 2023 uh, for sure. And and I think that's like the biggest mistake people make with AI is asking it to do the job for them. Uh, you know, asking it to write a headline, asking it to write a subject line. Like that's something that AI is still not able to do. I guess maybe in the future it will be. Uh, but at the moment, I feel like the, the most interesting thing you can do with AI, and that's actually how I spent the last five days. I've been writing an, a long guide about that on how to use ChatGPT to brainstorm. Um, is to use those, you know, those techniques uh, that we already know as writers and those, you know, thinking, thinking exercises um, to, you know, to, to, to make the AI do the research for us, to be our assistant, to be our intern uh, that never gets tired. And I feel like that's the right way to use it, because if you just ask it to write a headline, of course, it would be super obvious and, and boring. But if you ask it to do some research for you, um, and if you ask the right prompts and questions, just like with an inexperienced intern, by the way, um, the results can be incredible. And for example, in the new article I'm writing, I had, I was writing, I was working on some Kindle headlines on some Kindle ads, not, not really for Kindle, just, you know, just for fun for myself. And at some point I thought, you know, uh, I, I, I use, I've been using Kindle for a while now, and I really don't get people who still read um, printed books. Um, you know, because I feel like it, it's so much better. Like the features are great. It's, it's, it's light. It's, you know, you have, you know, it's, it just, it just way more convenient. You have a dictionary inside. So then I decided to ask chat GPT. I, I just told it like, you're, you're a person who is, who knows about Kindle, you know, the benefits, but you still insist on reading printed books. Why do you do that? And the reply was incredible. You know, it gave me all the answers, all the all, all the reasons I could hear in a one-hour interview. He told me, you know, I'm a traditionalist. I grew up in that environment, and I and I'm used to that. Or I love the smell of old books. Or I love the texture and the feeling in my hands. Um, or you know, plenty of other things. Um, that you know, that it just gave me this brilliant list of reasons. And that's something I could work with. And you know, I could write some ads using that. And I feel like that's the right way we should use AI, at least at the moment, you know, rather than asking it to do the job for us, we should, uh, you know, ask it to be our research assistant. And then we can work way more, you know, much more. Um, yeah, we can work quickly and still not lose our human touch and, you know, our original copy. Yeah, so I, I you know, because I, I tested them and I'm, I call myself an amateur copywriter. Um, I was very curious about it. And I think there's there's two types of people that would use it. The, the yeah. first type would be the the shiny object kind of people that say, oh, you know, why do I have to work so hard? I can put a <laughs> crappy, I can put a crappy headline, click on yeah. generate, and I get three different things. If I don't like them, I try again. Uh, there There is some, <laughs> it's sort of like Grammarly on steroids, but in a yeah. marketing sense, um, where somebody who doesn't want to spend the money on copywriting, yeah. Somebody who's rushing 
to do things quickly can take an AI platform and put some crappy stuff in it and it will fix it. Yeah. Uh, it will make it like a Grammarly style fixable content mm -hmm. that you can get away with. Yeah. But it's still the, the point that they're going to miss. It's yeah. From a correctness standpoint, it's way better than what you put in initially, but it's still not the right copy for your target audience because you're missing the intimate interaction with what it is that they, the problem you're solving and what they're looking for. Yeah. So that's the, the shiny object. Everybody's running. Uh, look, I, this is a generation of, I, in entrepreneurship, I call them lazypreneurs, right? <laughs> the, the, the business owners that don't want to, they just want to press buttons and find something that's going to generate a funnel and the funnel will lead to leads and the leads will mildly convert and life yeah. is good. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> good luck with that. Uh, don't think it really works. Mm -hmm. So the shiny object people is one thing, but the other piece of the people that can use copywriting is it can get you to think differently yeah. and improve your thinking. But like you said, it's the final product that's not going to be necessary, at least for now. What, what I found interesting, and I didn't know because I was very curious, they all use the same engine. Mm -hmm. That's true, right. Yeah. They all use the same engine is how they is how they modify and consistently improve the process yep. uh, is that it what makes the difference. So yeah. um, you wrote a thesis back when you were in, I guess, in school in Berlin on data and AI utilization and PR crisis management. That's that's a horrible name. Yeah, I know. <laughs> the, the, name is, the name is great. I mean... I mean, we could talk about PR. For me, this is one. <laughs> this is one discipline where people lie all the time. But yeah. <laughs> uh, but how did you how did you pick that? Um, th that's something I still do. Uh, I mean, like I, I was just very interested even back then in how in how we could because I feel like everything you know everything traditional has already been written. Uh, you know, we already know all the Ogilvy quotes and we already know all the all the basics. It's it's already there. And, and what's interesting now is just to find ways to, as you said, you know, to be lazy about it, but not even to be lazy, just to be more efficient, to, to find tools that could either make it automatic and help. And, you know, when, when we automate something that we used to spend a lot of time on, we can then focus on something more creative. Of course, if you said, you know, that, like the lazypreneurs who just don't want to do anything, that's, that's another thing. Uh, but I feel like, the, you know, the great hard about finding tools especially ai tools is that and as a creative or or you know marketing person or a pr expert or anything of that sort um is that you can always take the traditional basics that you know have been developed for for years and you can find ways to to implement them with a simple tool that then allows you to fo to focus on something way more interesting you know so if if i if i'm able to you know to automate my proofreading um, like like we do with Grammarly, then I can focus, you know, rather than, you know, going letter after letter and checking, checking my copy for hours, I can then focus on being more creative or doing, or, you know, or networking or doing something way more important. And I feel like I was interested in that back then. And I'm very interested in that today as well. Um, in my Thursdays, Thursday newsletters, I always have this um, little paragraph that is called Thursday Tools. And I always show different websites or tools that I'm finding that, you know, that help me do just that, that help me replace a little thing that I used to do manually in my process um, and do it a little bit more easily and quickly so that I can spend more time brainstorming or, you know, coming up with new ideas. Because I feel that, like that's the main thing we, we still, we can still, you know, we're the only one who can do that um, still. We're the only one who can be creative, not, not machines. And then all the rest, if we can replace that and spend more time being creative, then why not? You know, like that's, um, yeah, that's, that's my view on it. So if you had one message for entrepreneurs slash business owners when it comes to copywriting, what would you tell them? I would tell them to always focus on the insights. Uh, always focus on the relatable parts of, of copywriting, always asking them if what they're writing is based on an insight. And I think it's not only for copywriters or creatives, it's for all business owners, because I feel like 
any kind of business that is based on a human insight, you know, where you can phrase the insight behind it with, you can start it with the word people. For example, people want to stay updated or people are afraid, um, you know, to get lost or anything like that, then it, it would work like most of the mm -hmm. times. And if it's not, then it will not work. And it's the same with copy and it's the same with startups. And I, and I feel like that's, you know, that's the biggest mistake most people are making because I often get um, copywriters who send me their copy and they ask me, is that good? And it just, you know, it just, it's just a bunch of words. And even if they're written nicely, if there's no, nothing relatable behind them and nothing human, um, then, you know, then, then it's worthless. Then, you know, even if it's, you, you know, and on the contrary, if someone sends me a piece of copy that is, that is, you know, grammatically incorrect and it's just, you know, it doesn't have any rhyme, it doesn't rhyme or it doesn't have any rhythm or anything, but still it, it's, you know, it's based on, on smart insights on something, on something human behind it, then it works. Mm -hmm. And, and I think like that's, that's the main tip I would give to, to anyone who's in marketing, especially. Yeah, I, I think what you said was when a copywriter sent you something and says, hey, Shlomo, what do you think about it? Yeah. Um, I, I don't think we're able to give him an answer because it's, if you just want to know about the words you use, yeah, it looks pretty nice, but it's almost like a um, when you hear a song that you really like, you like the song, you like the melody, maybe you like the words, but if you yeah. don't know what led to writing the song, the personal experience of the writer, mm -hmm then it's it's sort of temporary, right? It's superficial. Yeah. So you use the word insights where for us as marketing people, we know what that means. Mm -hmm. uh, but for the average business owner, the people that I work with, uh, insights, I don't think they're going to understand yeah. what, what that word means. Yeah, so I, I think the best way to explain an insight is is just a human experience. You know, it's something that anyone could really anyone can relate to, um, and and you can relate to that only if you're a human. It's just part of our experience, and it could be a something that is more niche uh, that you could understand only if you you know if you grew up somewhere or if you live somewhere or you know if you belong to a certain industry or more general insights that you know any of us could understand and i feel like any creative business any type of content that we actually enjoy watching like if you take stand-up comedy or if you just take any netflix series it's always based on something like that on this one human notion um, that is very relatable, that we could all kind of feel something when we, when we see it. And I think great marketing is based on the same. That's, that's what we call insights. <laughs> yeah. Just, yeah. Great, great point. So I'm going to jump into my rapid fire questions. I'm not going to hit you Let's with the entire <laughs> list. I'm just going to pick a couple of things that might be interested. Um, Sounds good. One person that influenced your life, not in business. One person. Um, so that would be my that would be my childhood friend David. Um, he, we're still friends, but you know when we were kids, um, he used to get me out of my comfort zone every day. Like I, I used to be like a very quiet and yeah, like a shy kid. And every time we used to hang out, you know, our parents like got us together. And every time I, I met him, it was always terrifying. We always did something scary. You know, we always like he always made me. He was older and still and he always made me jump from a you know jump from off a cliff or uh, or climb into an abandoned building or do something scary <laughs> and i feel like you know after like we're still good friends and after after a few years i just got used to that and i got used to this <laughs> extreme extreme lifestyle i would say and i feel like that's that's a very big part of, of my personality today and, and everything i do yeah what's what's the best advice you've ever received the best advice um was from from a person who i once took a debate course and yeah and you know and the person who who taught it um you know i, I once went on stage and i wasn't very prepared and i started apologizing i said yeah i'm not i'm not sure i'm ready i, I don't know like yeah yeah like you know just just yeah don't take me too seriously and, you know, he, he just told me to shut up and he told me, yeah, like never, never, ever apologize before you start doing something because you never know how people will perceive that. Like maybe they will love that and you already ruin it for yourself just because you apologized. And, you know, and since then I've been going up on stage or presenting 
um, without really having a clue on what I'm going to do or, you know, with very bad ideas. And I always reminded myself not to apologize, even if it's bad. And, you know, sometimes it was still bad <laughs> uh, because that's, I think, that's the I creative think, life. And I think the second part to what you just said is to also recognize that you're never going to make everyone happy. Yeah. Uh, as, as my mentor Seth Godin said to me once, you know, even the number one bestseller on Amazon has one star rating, right? So <laughs> yeah. you just you just go out and and you be be genuine, do the best you can, and and yeah, just don't apologize, right? <laughs> exactly. Do what yeah. we do. So Shlomo, this was great. Uh, I'm 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 so glad you are the the new generation of genuine, talented people that that move are moving into the marketing uh, universe because I was a little bit scared that. <laughs> Uh, it's it's going to be overrun by shiny objects, gurus, and experts. Uh, but so w- with more people like you and and Eden and some other talented copywriters, um, the the creative part of marketing, which is what it's about, is the the connection with the human behavior, the human touch, uh, is going to continue to be there. So thank you for spending time with me. Um, Everyone will be able to see how to connect with Shlomo uh, on my show notes. Uh, if you want to find him, type the word Shlomo. You'll find some people, <laughs> but but uh, not too many. You'll find him. But I'm so, the real thanks one. Again. <laughs> thanks have, again. Thank and, you. And and happy ber- happy birthday <laughs> uh, in March. If I remember, <laughs> I'll I'll do it again. Zev, Back thank then. you so much. It was it was incredible meeting you. And yeah, <laughs> have a great evening. All right, thanks. <laughs> bye, thanks. bye, Zev. Be good. Thank you. Bye. bye.